You don't even need that. We started breaking down the numbers. You do a very, very lightweight um, composite two-layer uh, tank. So it has a shared bulkhead in the middle. It's 12 inches in diameter. It's 10 feet long. Um, holds about, it's about 1,000 pounds loaded. Um, and, and you have a common bulkhead in the middle. There's a center shaft where the, you have fuel in the top, locks in the bottom. The fuel actually comes through the locks tank. Um, and that gets set into an uh, electric displacement pump. Um, the rocket engine would have to be regeneratively cooled. Um, your control vanes, here's the cool part. So uh, controls are typically very expensive if you have high temperature vanes that go in the exhaust flow. Uh, so what we proposed was an external um, uh, air airfoil uh, which would position uh, your, your vector as it's leaving the atmosphere. So basically after it's left the atmosphere, you don't have control anymore. <laughs> it's 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 on its trajectory vector. Spin stabilized. That's a possibility. Yeah, we could yes. do uh, potentially some spin so stabilization. Air, aerodynamic aerodynamic control surfaces in atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Question mark question mark profit out of the atmosphere. <laughs> this is this is still something that's very much in development. One mm -hmm. of the reasons we're here is to get your ideas and criticisms on the technologies that are changing now that may someday make this. Mm -hmm possible for someone in their backyard or garage to build a single stage to orbit vehicle and and apply that equation. Uh, I have a large brushless motor driving a displacement pump that runs peroxide. Uh, you will discover that peroxide, since you're 17 to 1 on the fuel to oxidizer and the oxidizer is almost 40% denser than LOX, that you actually get better density ISP and mm -hmm. it's also composite compatible. Uh, the big problem is I don't think anybody's meant, made a positive displacement LOX pump uh, because the sliding seals don't work. We can't hear you back here. Uh, he, he mentioned that the sliding seals and a positive displacement LOX pump uh, uh, won't work very well because of the bypass rate? No, because uh, if you slide metals against each other in locks, they catch fire. Ah, uh, yeah, so that's, that's true. <laughs> and, and what... Um, and the way they solve that on the SSME is by gold plating all of the uh, components inside the LOX pump. Um, so making a high pressure LOX pump is extremely difficult. Uh, you can get it up to about 800 PSI using stainless steel components, um, but that's about your limit and you're still marginally combustible. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so make, making a high pressure LOX pump is one issue. You may actually, that may uh, be the limit of your chamber pressure is how high you can pump up your LOX. Um, another thing is how do you make a micro miniature um, turbo pump uh, that literally weighs uh, four or five ounces? Uh, how do you how do you machine something like that? How do you um, fabricate uh, cheaply? So you'd probably need to start investing in your garage and some small uh, CNC <laughs> tools and and uh, get very skilled with uh, mechanical design. Are, are there scaling issues with uh, small turbo pumps? Is it get smaller like your heat loss and stuff? Uh, scale you? Well, also your are I, I believe your RPM goes up as well, so it's harder to... Sp For some you don't see any turbo pumps lower than 55. Yeah, yeah, you got two problems. One, uh, the ratio of pump clearance from the end, you, your machining tolerances don't go up that much when you go small, mm -hmm. and uh, so you need the same tip clearance, so you have a much higher loss, um, and the RPM goes way up. But the cool thing is if you do it as staged combustion, it doesn't matter. You, you multiply the pump efficiency times the turbine efficiency. Uh, if you get over 5% of the combined efficiency for stage combustion, you'll still get chamber pressures on the order of 1,000 PSI. So you could build a small turbo pump. Yeah. I have mm -hmm. a friend who's trying to do that. Hmm. Um, the, the, technologically, that would be the, the limiter, I would think, would be the, the turbo pump. Um, uh, regenerative engines are, are um, companies like Xcore have demonstrated that they can do it very reliably. Um, very cheaply. Uh, the, the regenerative energy, it would have to be a thousand PSI engine. Um, it, uh, uh, sorry, a thousand PSI engine at about a thousand pounds thrust. Uh, we calculated it would be a two inch chamber, about two and a half inches long. And depending upon, you'd actually want to maximize your, um, your epsilon or your uh, exit velocity plane. So you'd want as big, a, um, as big of a a skirt on it as you could get, a, bit, a, a nozzle extension as you could get. Uh, so because you're going to spend the majority of your flight outside of the atmosphere. So in order to maximize your ISP, your performance on the rocket, uh, you would want a, a big of a nozzle as possible. Um, making that cheaply is another thing. You'd probably have to be something ablative. Um, well, big expansion rate 
ratios have big expansion ratios have flow disconnected uh, you know, discontinuities in sea level, and if you make the nozzle light, it actually will crush the nozzle. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. You're yeah, limited about true. forty percent. Forty percent. Beyond about of maximum. No one successfully does that. Ah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ten minutes left. Okay, cool. So all this is leading to uh, payload and orbit that is micro. So, you know, yeah, the the rocket is actually your payload. So you don't. De there's no deployment mechanism. It, it's extremely simple. There's no deployment mechanism. There's no um, re-entry. There's no satellite. It's just Have your you rocket. Have you read the AIA paper? I think it was titled "The Brick Launcher." Um, <laughs> guys at Lawrence Livermore proposed almost exactly what you're describing. Uh, it was SSTO. It was apparently formally done. I think their mass uh, budget was wildly unrealistic, <laughs> as I believe yours. <laughs> but uh, but it's, if you're interested in that, but find, find the paper, um, John Whitehead. Whitehead. Yeah, look up John Whitehead mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, John Whitehead. He, uh, I forget what did he call that project. I don't know, but just go, go to Whitehead. Go look at Whitehead. Okay, a a a AI AAA, AI AA paper. Whitehead. Yeah, okay. SSTO proposed launch for the yeah, just yeah, pretty good. Mockingbird. Huh? Mockingbird. Mockingbird. That's it. Yeah, I actually I reviewed Mockingbird. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, Mockingbird was a cool idea. I think his. Oh really? Uh, okay. I actually, thought, I actually <laughs> thought he couldn't build motors without press the weight ratio. Uh -huh. I well, I, I, they well for it. I had a few at the axe. Uh -huh. Another issue is um, the high G loads as you you approach your uh, final insertion point. Uh, you're talking 100, 200 Gs <laughs> at that kind of it's mass a huge ratio. Huge materials problem. Yeah. When Hasn't does, been solved yet. When does that happen? Uh, basically, when your tank's end. empty, uh, you're still making a thousand pounds thrust, and your whole vehicle weighs now nine pounds. pounds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the, basically, the only thing your rocket's basically a balloon at that point. The only thing holding it up is the pressure in the tank. Yeah. Well, you guys probably just do give yourself every chance. One or two tanks up like the highest mountain. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's ten foot long. I could put it in the back of my F-150, drive it up there. If we could throw it, <laughs> give it that much of a boost. Yeah. <laughs> So the idea, okay, so if we'll you could, you at that time. <laughs> um, so the business case for this, if you could actually build uh, this rocket satellite combo uh, for less than $10,000, uh, it could engage possibly a new, uh, new type of, you know, cheap satellite communication. So rather than having um, uh, land-based uh, CDMA type of cell phone technologies, you would just literally throw a thousand of these or 10,000 of these up there and, and cover the globe. Um, cell phone networks, high-speed internet. Um, at that point, it's just making cheap electronics, and, and that's pretty much what I do all day. <laughs> um, you know, transponders. You could have a some, some small. Everything that you do would have to weigh under a pound or so. But well, as I found, every time, uh, every little bit of complexity, every person that you have to add to a project to do more engineering, uh, it becomes exponentially more expensive. Simpler. Yeah, and even simpler than that. The other answer is because nobody's done it yet. Yeah, nobody's done it. It would also be pretty badass. Yeah. So. I think amateur in your garage Sputnik, even if you took 12 stages, would be pretty spectacular. <laughs> also true, yes. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. huh? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah, that, that's actually one of my personal goals is to do an amateur Sputnik. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'm using the. Uh, Oh, air dropping it? Orbital does it. Yeah, uh, it makes... Gives you a bit of a boost, yeah. It, it gives you a bit of a boost. <laughs> yeah, the, the drag issue... When you smaller, that makes more of a difference. Yeah, yeah. and your expansion ratio can be higher because you won't crush your nozzle by... You can be 40% of... Oh, that's true. I can be... A, yeah. Um, orbital, orbital, launch, uh, orbital systems does a, a plane launch with their mm -hmm. Pegasus. Yeah. yeah. So why is that, how come that hasn't been more widely utilized? So getting that first 60,000 feet, that's the hard part, right? On Locking larger rockets, large not rocket so much. Is difficult. You can only do it with small. Mm -hmm. So far you can only do it with small rockets because we don't have planes large enough to loft all that fuel. Because the thing's, it's all fuel, right? You're, you're lofting basically a giant fuel tank. It'd be like trying to take 
you, you basically have to fly a tanker. Mm -hmm. It's also pretty hard to convince someone to let you keep a rocket so, on their airplane. Yeah. yeah. If, I mean, if you've ever seen Moonraker, you can see how that can get uh -huh. Also, the, the flight would cost as much as the rocket cost, so, or more. So, so the point is, 120 kilometers is about the absolute minimum you could imagine in orbit. It's to sustain even a, a short hour. orbit, yeah. But, but uh, the problem isn't getting that high. That's actually easy. The problem is you've got to be going so fast around here, you know. You ever play tetherball? <laughs> you know? Okay. Well, if you just push the ball out, it swings out and comes back. It doesn't take much energy. If you get it to go around, you really got to whack it. So 25 <laughs> times as much energy as yeah, if you're going yeah. around as if you're going the up. Mm -hmm. So the airplane will get you 60,000 feet out of your 120 kilometers of the up. Yeah. A little teeny bit yeah. of the round, yeah. but it doesn't give you the round. Really, what it saves you is the air, aerodynamic air drag, drag mm -hmm. yeah, that you lose. You and also, aero losses are e even relatively uh, just a few percent of the total delta V requirements to reach orbit. Actually, um, the interesting thing where you do get a gain on the whack is by launching <coughs> equatorially. So, one of the things a plane does give you is you can fly at zero, you can fly along the equator. And that already gives mm -hmm. you a huge, a huge kick. 400 meters. Yeah, much more than the plane will give you. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that that you get with a plane launch is you can launch. That's why everyone launches close to the equator. It's not because we like tropical islands. It's because you, the closer you get to the equator, the cheaper you get that launch. rotational energy of the Earth yeah. to uh, accelerate your rocket uh, to yeah, begin the with. The rotational energy of the Earth is like 400 meters per second. Yeah. The difference in drag losses that you'll see launching on the ground versus the 6,000 feet. I think it doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you have an airplane, you can yeah. do both. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If my car lets you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so my, my background is actually I have a uh, business degree. I, I studied international business at San Diego State, and then I ended up getting into rockets. So I'm always interested in the business case. How do you make it ch simpler, uh, fewer people? Uh, and, and, and cheaper. Um, and, and the main thing is to get, um, keep as few people involved as possible, unless they're volunteers. <laughs> um, you want to have, uh, you know, maybe just a handful of people on the project. Uh, you want to use off-the-shelf components as much as possible. Uh, you know, for controls, you can get these uh, 8051 processors for for 10 bucks. Uh, they'll control. All your your control aero control surfaces. Uh, you can use muscle wire. You can use cheap lightweight servos. Uh, you don't need a lot of displacement if you if you have a good uh, mechanical construction of the tanks. Uh, it'll be already pretty symmetrical. Um, there's a lot of complexity involved in the design, but the parts don't have to be expensive. So with the right people, the right team, um, you can I, I believe you could do an SSTO um, pretty cheap. It'd be uh, the world's most complicated engineering project, but uh, it wouldn't have to be expensive. So. It would be really cool. You guys, you guys talked to Gary Hudson. Gary Hudson was a guy who probably doesn't... Back in the back decade or so ago, when he had the mini space race back in the 90s, and, uh, he was doing it. I think it was doing space program, wasn't he? Yeah. And it's still stage? Yeah, Roton. Okay. Yeah, Roton. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He made a lot of... He, he's actually had Tom Clancy on his board for a while. And they raised a lot of money and burned up a lot of... A lot of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It was an interesting concept. They couldn't get it. To, couldn't get the motor to cool. Uh, also, I think composite locks tanks are a problem. Um, yeah, they are dangerous. Now, okay. So, that, thank you. That's another uh, important point. Composite <laughs> locks tanks are are dangerous. <laughs> okay, they're extremely dangerous. That doesn't. That 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 doesn't. That's not a showstopper, though. <laughs> All right. So, um, yes, of course, if you walked up there and you tapped it, the thing would explode. Just don't friggin' tap it, all right? You want your fuel on the bottom because the locks is the higher mass and you want to slow the forward from the stability. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, but the, the thermal difference there are on a common bulkhead uh, in composite land is going to be sporty. Yeah. So it's going to be, you're saying it's going to shrink a lot. Well, you're going to break your. It's going to be brittle? Cryogenic. Composite tanks are hard. Mm -hmm. I happen to know uh, Microcosm is about the only people who built cryogenic locks tanks. The guy who does all Microcosm stuff is a, name, a guy named John Newman. He's out at FAR on a regular basis. 
Uh, I actually worked with him on the Bloodhound project, which is a land speed record car. He did the motor case that you do build the test stand. Um, but uh, it's composite lock tanks are hard. Okay. Yeah. And mainly in construction? Is that the hard part? Well, it's the uh, you get micro fracking of the epoxy. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. because, because your epoxy and your, well, carbon fiber has got a CTE of basically zero. Uh-huh. Okay. Epoxy, not so much. Okay. And so, you know, you're talking a 270 degree temperature difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to get epoxy that cures at minus 270, so you're going to have to, uh, you know, cure it at room temperature and then run the temperature down and then the differential expansion, basically you end up with a carbon fiber bag with no <laughs> structure. <laughs> hmm. Um, minutes. The other issue is that it doesn't have to last very long. I mean, you could fill it up literally um, 20, 10 seconds before you launch, uh, run like hell, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it's, hit the button. It's probably not going to be an explosion hazard if it's not pressurized. You know. Yeah, and that's the other thing. It won't be pressurized until it gets uh, higher up in altitude, at which point you have a gravitational head. But. Ah, okay. There's also um, uh, the composite that Xcore developed. Um, non-burnite. Non-burnite. Um, but I don't think... Uh, it's a at fully fluorinated something or other, and I think it's unobtainium. Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's pretty good, although I don't think I'd be able to license it for the uh, type of budget I'm looking at. So, uh, If you think about, I mean, your densest room storable ox oxidizer is nitric acid. It's very dense, like 1.5, 1.6. You could build a composite nitric acid compatible tank and it gets rid of all your thermal problems. Um, and it gives you a lot of other problems. <laughs> they're, they're different. Well, the ISP yeah. wouldn't be as high though either, right? Yeah. Your density is so much better than your density. Oh. I, I like the, the, the figure of merit density ISP squared yeah. because it actually says how, what sort of delta V can I get out of this tank structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually think it's higher. Hmm. Any other questions, ideas, criticisms? Could you do a launch from a balloon? I mean, I've seen lots of these Potentially, super yeah. cheap projects to get like, mm -hmm. a balloon and a USB up there. But yeah. Uh -huh. People yeah. have done yeah. it. That's still a two-stage thing, though. It's like kind of JP yeah, but balloons are cheap. You know, yeah, they, yeah. JP Aerospace does that. Uh -huh. They launch rockets with balloons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's uh, there's balloon launch possibilities. Uh, there's my buddy who's a pilot. He can fly a Cessna pretty high. <laughs> Fire! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll hang him from the wings. He, you know, can, he, take can, off. he can go higher if the separation system doesn't That's work. Right. Right. Uh -huh. But yeah, I mean, even mm -hmm. we can just build a liquid-fueled rocket yeah. in a garage. Yeah. It'd be already an enormous, yeah. enormous achievement. Uh, come, in, come out to Mars and do it on a regular basis. Uh -huh. What is Mars? Seriously, Mars. Friends of amateur rocketry. It's out in the Mojave Desert. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, about an hour east. Yeah, we've got bunkers, we've got we've got uh, viewing, we've got firefighting, uh, you know, and mm -hmm. it's uh, you think we should go? all amateur yeah, facility, so basically if you want to use it, just come out, invest in sweat equity, you know, come help pour some concrete or work on stuff and bring your project and everybody will help you. Well, thanks for everybody's feedback, I really appreciate it. Hope we uh, get to build us. Uh, just congratulate you for having the audacity to give it a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I don't. Unfortunately, I have the audacity, but I don't have the free time. So <laughs> it might be. A, yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody.